Barry Granger. Uh, I was born and raised in the Merry Valley. Um, I did leave the Merry Valley for a little while with my work life. Then after that, I came back into the Merry Valley. Uh, our family came into the Merry Valley in the mid 1800s. My great grandfather, John Granger, uh, and then he settled land over on the northwestern side of Yabba Creek. Uh, and there is a mountain called Granger Mountain, which it was named after him from settling that area. Uh, my grandfather, he was born and raised in the district. He became a bullocky and uh, had bullock teams right up until the end. Um, I think it was the mid 50s, early to mid 50s that he gave the bullock teams away. And one of his bullock, t bullock wagons today is in Heinz's foyer up at Meribah. Lambert Heinz, he uh, requested if he could use it. It was just discarded in the forestry and he came down, picked up two wagon wagons and then took them to Meribah and refurbished them and got one out of the two. Then we go away from the grandfather um, into my family. Uh, Dad was born in the Merry Valley in the 1920s. Um, he worked all his life in the Merry Valley, uh, in as far as Gympie. He did have a little stint in Gympie at one stage, but nearly all his life was in the Merry Valley. And then there was myself. I came along and um, I was born and raised in the Merry Valley, did my schooling there, uh, started, finished school, after my junior exams at uh, 1 o'clock, 1.30 in the afternoon, started my first job at 4 o'clock the same day with Hine and Sons in their sawmill, the, what they call the top mill. Uh, not long after that, starting there, I was offered three jobs in the one day, uh, an apprenticeship and two, another labouring job plus the job with Queensland Rail, which I took up. Uh, I started my working life at Inwell at the railway there as a porter um, after that, I travelled to Brisbane, did a little bit of work in Brisbane, did a few exams and qualified myself to become a station master. Uh, I travelled into central Queensland and worked a few years there in the coal line industry with the coal trains and then came back into the North Burnet and then back into Brisbane. And then I decided to have a bit of a rest from QR and retire in 1992. Well, that didn't happen because I got bored. <laughs> Um, after a little while of sitting around at home and annoying the wife, I decided to start up a livestock transport business and from there on I retired from that April last year, 2020. 1969. I was taken along with a member of the Shea Society to a meeting and he paid my membership and junior membership back then was 20 cents. So that's how I became involved in the Shea Society and have been attached to the Shea Society and involved with them for 50 years. Uh, last year I handed over and said that was enough after 50 years and retired. But I saw a lot of things change in the Shea Society over those years. Um, before I even got associated with the Shea Society, uh, my parents, mum and dad, they were tied up with the Shea Society, volunteering on Shea Day, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Mum did a lot of cooking in the pavilion, etc. Um, and my grandfather uh, lent his ground, which is right beside the showgrounds, to be used as, at one stage it was used as a car park, and at other stages for the novelty events for the young kids with their pony club and that on show day. I've been associated for 50 years, um, fairly active member while I was around. While I was away, I used to only come home for the show, etc. But uh, while I was around here, I was fairly active. A um, lot of volunteering. It's a lot of work. And in uh, about 2009, I became... No, sorry. Uh, 1992, I was secretary for a couple of years. And then in 2009, I became vice president. And within about... 18 months I ended up president because the president we did have resigned for personal reasons and then I just took over as president and I was there right up until last year February 2020 when I finished up. Back in the 60s the rodeo part of the Shea Society was held in the full arena there was no such thing as a confined area like a small rodeo arena it was just the full full ring and horses used and bulls used to come out and just buck from one end to the other. And then in the late 60s, 
about the time I joined the Shea Society, the NRA was formed and their riders and competitors demanded that they have a small arena to compete in. So that's when the small arena came to being. Um, over time, back in the 60s, there was a couple of really good horticultural people out there. Old George Kerridge grew crop after crop of vegetables and he used to bring a truckload of vegetables to the show for the pavilion display and a full truckload he used to bring and they'd spend all day exhibiting them and setting them up and needless to say, George took out most prizes. These days are nowhere near as good as what they used to be. You walked in the front door of the hall and the middle of the hall, right from front to back, was just vegetables. The right hand side was pineapples. Pineapple industry was very big in those days. And from the front to the back of the hall was pineapples on the right hand side. And on the left hand side, it was needlework. And then right down near the front of the hall was the cooking. And um, flower, the hoard, um, yeah, the flower displays were up on the pavilion. On the start, start, sorry, the flowers were up on the stage in the pavilion. Yeah, which we still have everything today, but nowhere near the volume of what was back then. Yeah, and the show society's changed a lot. Like volunteers back then, they were dime a dozen. They were the backbone of all societies. They still are, but it's very hard to get volunteers now. Whereas back then, the whole town put their hand up to help their annual show. Whereas now, you have the old diehards, the, just the handful of them, but you've nearly got a yeah, you nearly have to beg to get people to come and give you a hand. Yeah, and then they want to know what, what's in it for them. Yeah, it is a shame, but that's the way society goes now. Last year, yeah, we got our 100 years in, which was 1919, but the 20, uh, sorry, the 2019 show was our 100 years, but our 2020 show didn't go ahead because of the pandemic. It's what the world needed, a reset, and this is the reset. Yeah, they are organising. Um, it will be a totally different show if it goes ahead because of crowd control, social distancing, everything. Uh, but they haven't made, they are organising towards it, but they haven't made any final decisions. Yeah, Most likely, definitely, yes. <laughs> because show day, when you're tied up volunteering and, and you're running the show, you don't see it. You're just, it's just a full day from four o'clock in the morning till nine, ten o'clock at night, you just work and you don't realise what's happened till next day. And some of your workers say, oh, did you see this? Did you see that? Haven't got a clue what they're talking about. <laughs> well, that day will come eventually, but it'll be a long time, I think. Um, it'll be a few years. But it's, it'll, like, it'll be a good show if they go ahead with it. But it's just like most people now do know a bit about social distancing, etc., etc., And... A lot of people respect it, but you do get a bit in the crowd, like there's been an odd event around, you, you see people doing the right thing and then all of a sudden there'll be a crowd over there, you know, just doing the wrong thing, but that's life, that's people, that's human. I found out with a phone call from the council office and uh, it surprised me a bit, uh, but yeah, it, it was a, a privilege to be honoured that way. Um, I'd put in a lot of years volunteering and... Um, to be recognised for it, I was yeah a bit stoked about all that, but um, it's just part of life. Like our generation, we were part of the community, and like the whole community as a whole just helped each other. Whereas now communities have changed a little bit; they still have their little organisations, but they're not a combined community organisation. Just their little community community there, organisation there, and another organisation there, which is a little bit different. And it's a shame, really, because volunteering, you get a lot of, you, you get a lot of pride out of it, um, and it's, it's good to see something keep going. Uh, that's the thing that worries me with the Shea Society. Um, will it keep going? We got to 100 years. There were struggles in that time. Um, back in the 80s, like, the Shea Society nearly became bankrupt, but they pulled themselves out and thanks to a few ladies that decided that we're going to make cakes and sell them and whatever, they dug us out of the hole and it continued on and it's a very viable show society now. But those sort of situations, they do happen through as you go along. But volunteer, volunteers, in my last, well, at our official opening, 
I, for our 100 years, I said that day that volunteers were the backbone of our Shea Society, and I think they're the backbone of all organisations. And you've just got to step up to the plate and give a little bit back to your community. That, that's the big thing. Our whole family right back have always been fairly community minded. Um, they've all volunteered right back from my grandfather, my, my father, mother and my sister. She was tied up with the Shea for quite some years and she was the secretary at one stage. And, but, you know, it's just, it must be in our DNA. We, we don't mind volunteering, but there comes a time you just got to say that's enough. When we were young, it, it was different to what it is today, and you've just got to grow with the times. You just can't sit back and reminisce about rolling the Jaffers down the picture theatre floor and things like that. But they were good times, um, but there's good times now. You've got to progress with society as it, as it grows and continues on. But those, my younger life, like, you always remember it, like, go-karts down hills and mates riding push bikes out through your father's back door of the garage and down a three metre drop and things like that. You'll always remember them, but you've just got to grow with your community and continue on. The most of the biggest thing I miss is when back in the 60s and 70s, like we knew everyone. We could walk up from one end of town to the other end of town. You knew everyone that lived in every house. If you wanted to walk in, if you were thirsty, you could go and just walk in and knock on the door and, oh, Mrs. Stanky or Mrs. Stebbins or so-and-so, could I have a drink of water, please? You'd get a drink of water. If you did that today, you'd have the doors slammed on your face because people just don't communicate the way they used to. Like, they're good people, but they just don't know the people around them. And it's just a sad thing that the community has gone that way, I think. It's just a, a different different community. But it's still a good community. Um, the Mary Valley's always been a fairly strong community. Uh, and I see the villages now, the, well, they call them villages, we call them towns in our day. They've grown, they've got stronger, um, but there are still good communities um, throughout, yeah. That's going right back, that's in the very early 60s. Uh, steam trains were still around then. Um, I do remember the steam trains in the Mary Valley. Um, and just as we go on with that, when I started in Queensland Rail at Imble, I travelled on that old Rattler that's, well, they, they tell me the one in town isn't the one, and it's most likely not the one that used to run out there. But I think it was RM53, I'm not 100% certain on that. That was, I think, would have been, that was my only trip back then in the Mary Valley on a train. On that Rattler, I had to come to Gympie and have my medical to, to get pass to go into the railway. So yeah, but the trains used to come, um, there would be a whole train with steel and all sorts of things, machinery and that would come in and be unloaded at Imble and taken up to Barumba Dam. Um, back in the days, those days, there used to be three trains a week. Out in the pineapple season, when there was a lot of pineapples around, they used to run two extra trains. Uh, Monday, Wednesday and Friday were train days. Tuesdays and Thursdays, there was extra trains put on in the middle of the peak pineapple season. Yeah, and the roll mater used to travel. At one stage, it was daily, in and out to Gympie, and then it, I think it cut back to three days a week until it finished up just very early 70s, I think it was, when the roll mater stopped. Yeah. But, uh, but the dam, it, it changed. Everyone had a job when the dam was on. There was people who left jobs to go and work at the dam because there's a few extra dollars up there. And um, the, the dam was a big employer for a few years while it was there. Uh, and then the forestry, it was a big employer, but that has all changed now. They've deregulated and whatever. But, um, yeah, the, the workforce in the valley has changed a heck of a lot over the last 50 years, 60 years. Mm -hmm. That's right, you went where the work was and like um, there was even pineapple farmers that just virtually shut down their farms, the smaller ones, and went and worked at the dam for a few years to make a few dollars, then they came back to their pineapple farms. And uh, yeah, there was things like that happen. Then left the sawmills to go to the, to the dam and the day it happened we heard the announcement, the first thing we heard was on the radio and then the news that night it was just everywhere with 
them standing out there and saying, this is where we're going to build the dam to save Brisbane. That was the main thing. Uh, I think the only thing he was trying to save was his own political hide. But anyway, that's another story. But, um, yeah, and the community, as soon as the announcement was made, the community just got up in arms. They got cranky and then they realised where it was going. And then people started, people with a little bit of now saying, well, you know, once you come out of the riverbanks, there's nothing, it's just flat. So how much water are you going to start, save or store? And then it started coming out, oh, about three metres, and then everyone got on the bandwagon and said it's not viable, and then the fight started, and that's where it went. We have a bit, had a business, um, we had a livestock transport business. It, it took about 58% of our business away from us overnight, and that lasted for years. Like, it, we were just lucky that, you know, we had other things and we did have a few beef cattle and that that we could keep plodding on. But um, it was only after the announcement was made by Peter Garrett that it wasn't going to go ahead, that you could see it turn around a bit then. Uh, and our business, I wouldn't say overnight, but within six to nine months, it started to show signs of recovery. And in the last three or four years, it's been a very good business again. Most likely the biggest thing is the demographics of the Mary Valley, how they've changed. Like back in the 50s, 60s, it was timber, pineapples, dairy farming, and that was the, and small crops. They were the big income earners for the Mary Valley. And as times go by, the small crop has disappeared. The pineapple industry is virtually, there's only one pineapple farmer left in the Mary Valley. And up until some years ago, every ridge, when you left Imble and drove to Gympie, every ridge was covered in pineapples. Well, today there is none, virtually nothing. The dairy industry is the same. Like the whole valley just made a living, all the better river flats and that, was just dairy farms everywhere. Well, they're virtually all gone. There's a handful left. And um, I don't know how they're going now. 12 months ago, they were still in the doldrums. But, um, you know, those sort of things, they just change. And I don't know whether it's for the better. I, I really don't think it is. Um, People rely on tourism now, but tourism can only go so far. It, it really is like, it doesn't matter whether you come from overseas or you're in Australia, tourism can help, but I don't think it can bring value into the valley what our industries used to bring into our valley. Yeah. And I think that's, that's a bad thing. We're, we're too reliant on tourism now. We should be still trying to rely on our core industries.